One of the most common fates to befall the works of any amateur creator, especially in the written word, is to be too verbose, superficial, or even just convoluted. In the words attributed to Blaise Pascal, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. So if you don't wish to continue, for the sake of brevity, I will at this point condense my thoughts into as short a statement as possible. <laughs> Once again, I am imploring you, if I truly have any influence in your life, in some abstract way, do not watch this film. There are thousands of films that are better, let alone the number of things that are just more worth your time. I consider this film to be a barely decent second to just being alone with your thoughts. Your max squad is 250 kilos, mine is the crushing thought of dying alone. We are not the same. When I talked about the first film, go watch the video, I went a bit into the behind the scenes nature of the film's creation. If that does interest you, Again, watch that video, because almost every name on the production side will be incredibly familiar, with the notable exception of the producers, of which there are now twice as many, which is always an excellent sign. My favourite sign is the one that says stop, but the show must go on, because despite everything in the deepest crevices of my heart, I am a performer, and otherwise I also don't get paid. Subscribe to my channel and buy my merchandise, otherwise I'll starve on purpose. As the movie begins, you might feel a hammering headache imminently approaching as you come to the realization, oh my god, please don't be the exact same film, oh, please dude. For the sake of everyone's health, I'll spoil it just a tad and assuage your fears, it is not a carbon copy. It is significantly worse in almost every facet. For one, the text on the two-tone background that I harped on in the last video uh, is not just returned, it is essentially conveying what feels like the exact same information. Now, while necessary for the exposition of a film, especially a sequel, the next few minutes after this also do the same thing but marginally better. Almost like if before speaking in this video, I described the plot of the film in a Star Wars scroll, uh, but in hieroglyphics. Not only is it a waste of your time, it does raise the question if I'm intentionally being a dick. The better way, taking the form of a reporter recapping the first film in a very serviceable way. We are live at the Texas State Cemetery for the memorial service of Blake Redding, son of Texas Governor Dean Redding, who lost his life when he failed his thinning exam last week at Vista Point High School, which has shrouded the governor's campaign for president in a flurry of controversy. My only critiques of this being the color grading, which I would describe as professionally weird, and the somewhat comedic flashback cutaways. Some of them are to the first movie, and that's okay. Then it starts rapidly showing characters that are being introduced, but they're like posing, like they're on the cover of Time. Z up kids, get in the coffin. My favorite one is from Mason King, from the first movie, where the shot is oddly claustrophobic. It's like the photographer's just really invested in how many nostril hairs he has. Like it's Chekhov's nose or something. This is the point of the film where we are introduced to what I'm calling the A side of the plot, which follows Lena and her quirky adventures in the fun loving city of uh, uh, Austin, Texas. It's not the A plot because it's more important. It's first, as in chronologically, which is never a particularly good sign. If your child was described by a teacher as first alphabetically, you have raised the childhood embodiment of a war crime. It is also at this point that I realized Governor Redding, Blake Redding's father, uh, genuinely thought he was sending his son to his death. While this makes the character slightly more interesting than a pile of loose cardboard, uh, it's actually incredibly stupid that he isn't in on it. I'd also like to throw in, have you ever noticed that when a movie's trying to portray a dystopian society on its last legs, or just anything bad, they go to like Austin, Texas in real life because it's just an American city slathered in tarmac. It literally can't be more depressing. Immediately after the funeral, Lena's being interrogated. I assume at night, because it certainly isn't time for mourning. <sighs> like with the, the U instead. Uh, I miss my life so much. The conversation goes as you would expect, up until a certain point. You know, how did you meet Blake? What did you know about him? The general vague things and uh, what everyone else knew. And um, also, here's a picture of you telling the truth. Oh wait, it's, no it's you kissing, dude. Dude, were you lying to me? Cause if, if it sounds like you were fucking lying to me, dude. It's kind of weird, dude. Look me in the look me in the eyes. Turn those sweet baby blues towards me and tell me that you didn't know him. Okay, firstly, he just died. She literally just came back from the funeral. 
Bit of a dick move. This, however, acts as the setup for what Lena's plot is actually about, which is super boring, uh, but it's not relevant for now, so I'll actually be talking about it later. Kellen shows up again, this time as a newbie reporter, building on his character arc from the first film, with him and Governor Redding being the only characters to do so, somehow making him more interesting and likeable than the main cast. Please have character arcs spanning both movies in the sequel. Please, oh, I wish upon a star as the monkey poor curls. In fact, once again, Kellen is a driving factor in the film, even more so than the first one, because while Lena is giving the amnesty attempting governor and writing the old, oh look, I dropped it, go fuck yourself. Kellen is busy piecing together while writing his obituary that Blake's body was never seen post-mortem. Kind of strange that the entire cover-up of a monolithic secret could be easily uncovered by a guy asking a question, but like an underpaid water park employee who's just been given his two weeks, I'll let that baby slide. So once our main cast, Kellen, and the side character, Lena, uh, investigate Schrodinger's casket, they discover, wow, it's empty. Cut to Blake waking up on the elevator to hell, also known as manual labor. Dear God, the horror. I think just below the ninth circle of hell, where the traders are frozen solid and uh, mauled by Satan, is the tenth circle, where you're just a customer-facing service worker. You get sent there if you've ever made one of them cry. I'm going to compliment the film now, so don't... Trying to faint. For as uninteresting as I find watching this movie so far, the pacing has been pretty okay. I've talked about it before, but usually you want to get things moving in the plot by about 10 minutes. The Thinning 2 introduces all of the main players, motivations, and recaps the first one by the 11 minute mark, which is a damn sight faster than a lot of movies. At this point, we have been introduced to both sides of the track, so to speak, since The Thinning is only actually in school, the leads aren't in school anymore. So in universe, they have no reason to interact with the namesake of the films. This is what we call the Hunger Games problem. So instead of the thinning, but now in college, we have two separate plots. Lena is experiencing your generic crime, political drama, thriller thing, working in secret to uncover the truth, break the system as it were. Uh, Blake is just in Maze Runner, but with less running and less people named Dylan O'Brien, therefore making it worse. Now Lena's out of the way, I get to talk about Blake Redding and The Chosen, which is by far the worst and best parts of the film. In order to introduce both the frightened teens and bored audience to the current situation, an orientation video plays. For some reason, the video starts while the class is still asleep. Specifically the phrase, congratulations, you have been spared and given a second chance at life, uh, said by the uh, stand-in Amy actress. No idea if you'll get that. But this is said to barely conscious teens. There's no way they heard that. And what if you like, woke up a bit late? Would you just not understand? Would you miss that part? Whoopsies. Blake's whole thing is basically connecting with Ellie again, his girlfriend who, from the first film, and coming to terms with his new surroundings, which as you hopefully remembered, I compared to the Maze Runner because Blake's story is every young adult dystopia akin to Divergent, Hunger Games, and Maze Runner, where under the heel of an authoritarian force uh, arbitrarily separating the population, our heroes must relentlessly fight back by assigning as many pseudonyms and poorly thought out proper nouns to their problems as humanly possible. There's faction, districts, gladers, tributes, the dark days, the games, the capital, with an O. However, my favorite is Maze Runner. There are several minute long sequences of just proper nouns being thrown at you. Also self-explanatory that explaining them feels kind of a bit infantilizing. The aforementioned gladers, where do they live? The glade. The runners, they run. Grievers, they cause grief. The changing, keeper, greenie, the slammer. That's just the word for the jail. That's in real life. The thinning New World Order has less, but equally stupid names. They have the chosen, who are chosen, the incubator, um, which is an incubator. And when someone disobeys or acts out of the norm, they get taken away and come back as different people, which is inherently a little spooky. However, the phrase they use to taunt people is snip snip. Snip, snip. A little less intimidating than perhaps the writers were aiming for. For sure, the implications are truly nightmarish, but just saying snip snip does not convey the same feeling of dread. To me, it is as if you try to convey the psychological horror of death by firing squad, being shot by your own team, your friends even, with the phrase shooty shoot. Maybe don't. In the meantime, Blake has reunited with Ellie, uh, who he now knows isn't dead, 
and from a purely romantic perspective. What a green flag, not being deceased, am I right? <laughs> Cannot relate. She's like, oh, I'm not dead, I'm not, what's good? And he's like, oh, I thought you were dead. <laughs> <laughs> but hold on, this movie has no originality and Blake has no reason to even be in the film. So uh, what's his plot gonna be? Oh, look, it's a high school bully and he's back free, but I mean, he's backup boys that are like, the fuck dude? and they have like this weird master pet relationship going on. It's really engaging. So engaging, Blake actually tries to escape with her, which results in them being caught and subsequently skipping eight months because it is the first quarter of the film, which is typically not when the story ends. So now we have the setup for our two stories in the film. Stories that are almost mutually exclusive to each other, one of them being a YA novel with no stakes, and the other one being a different YA novel with some stakes. For as hard as I slammed the thinning for being the thinning, due to a like budget, lackluster script, and uncharismatic main cast, among other things, uh, it was at least trying to be an action-ish thriller set in a high school, justified by a dystopian future. We're driving the speed limit and in the right direction, it's just that direction is towards Florida. It's still not a good film, but it does at the very least feel like a complete package with some care and respect. This film has split the screen time of the main plot in twain. Unfortunately, my interest in the story has not done the same in such a linear fashion. My waning interest in these characters has all but plummeted. In fact, the most interesting character with the most engaging story is found in Kellen, who barely gets any screen time since he's a side character in one half of the film, yet somehow does most of the stuff in it. Imagine most of the rebel solutions coming from Chewbacca. Good for him. One moment, Sure, two, no worries, but all of them. Like, maybe Luke could solve a problem. He is on the front of the poster. Blake Saxon assumes you care about him or Ellie. One of these people I don't know because I've never met, and the other one I know everything about because there's really nothing to learn. Blake has the intricacies of a wet cardboard box, since these actions have no established greater consequences, like potentially exposing a corrupt system like Lena, the outcomes of this story are inherently limited. Therefore, so are my reasons to care. Lena's part is significantly more fleshed out. In fact, it's the greatest downside of Lena's story. Not only is her half responsible for all of the main plot developments, most of the world building, most of the interesting characters, and the most characters in general, it kind of brings up why the fuck are we cutting back to Thunderfuck in his depressing romance life? This is because, in contrast to Blake's Maze Walker, uh, Lena's story is basically a political spy drama where she is forced to sell her soul pretending to campaign against what she believes in to get close to this woman for this underground society who wants to stop the thinning. It is both too dense for it to be only half of the film and still too boring for me to even think it's worth talking about, so I'll just breeze through the story the best I can. Kellen figures everything out in probably the most entertaining scene of the film, but the main through line is exposing the truth and getting Lena's siblings over the border. This series of events includes Kellen almost getting assassinated, then actually assassinated. There's two different double crosses, maybe even three, I wasn't paying attention. A scene where Lena hacks the mainframe after shimming off a ledge uh, out of a window, all resulting in mass arrests of innocent people. Blake, on the other hand, fights a man, fights more men, escapes with Ellie, and fights one last man. I'm being deliberately simple for the sake of comedy. Unfortunately, I don't have to try very hard. Things do happen in Blake's story, although I imagine your enjoyment of those elements has a direct and linear relation to how stupid you are. Again, I'm only mostly serious. The majority of obstacles in his story wouldn't feel out of place in a high school musical film. In fact, they would probably make a decently compelling plot if the interludes were filled with catchy show tunes instead of pensive brooding. One of said plots involves a previously shown but not named man with the inspired name Cage. Guess where he spends his time? Essentially, he's the alpha of the misfits, who have been completely indoctrinated into believing they actually have a chance of being reintegrated despite no proof, along with the fact that uh, Asura Global's generally shifty behavior makes that unlikely, and even stranger, uh, it's revealed by Blake as if it's a twist to us. To me, it is the same as being told any story about Amazon. Literally any of them. If it turned out an integral part of their cardboard boxes were tears of their factory workers, I would believe you with no proof. It treats the students as if they were taken as children, 
but some of them are bordering on adults with advanced problem solving skills. Cage is manipulating one of the new girls into gaslighting Allie to not listening uh, to Blake by being a toxic boyfriend. And perhaps it is now, uh, you realize when I say in the grand scheme of things, this is not interesting. In terms of all of the scenarios you could possibly milk out of a dystopian future and this setting, this may very well be the least interesting one. If you give me the magical world of Harry Potter, then whisk me away to show Clarence and Deborah going through the process of filing for a divorce, I'm not going to be thoroughly invested if you know what I mean. Although to catapult myself, the whole snip snip thing is something that modifies the experience from no tension to a single tension, just the one. However, to reverse trap card myself, and unlike the thinning, there's little rhyme or reason for it happening apart from someone just not doing their job, which unlike failing a test, is not something that has build up nor a ticking clock factor. In fact, this happens to Ellie. Getting gaslit causes Ellie to be quote unquote sad. However, this is not properly conveyed that it will be the whole snip snip thing. So as far as we know, she's just like, asleep. Not really a whole lot of tension there, I gotta say. Thankfully, after Blake beats Cage to a bloody mess, he tells him that he's wrong. And you know, why would Blake not be telling the truth? He's a bastion of morality, so they all agree to help him. Films are a magical experience. On a positive note, as they escape, this scene happens for a few seconds, and I think it looks sick. I don't have to explain myself, it's probably better if I don't. While I'm not invested in the plot of either character, the parallel ramping of tension between being betrayed, being betrayed, and being trayed, what the, it is a decently good continuation of energy uh, that keeps things amped up while they're happening. Unfortunately, this feels like the last showdown of the final act, but due to the two plots splitting once again into three, it's a bit more complicated than that. It's just timed in a way where Lena and the kids are more or less out of danger a bit earlier than Blake is which makes things a little awkward. When Blake and Ellie are trying to escape with their lives, we cut to like a bus or conversation. It would be nigh impossible to line the plots up to conclude at identical times. It's like catching someone's gaze through the gap in a bathroom stall. It's no one's fault this happened, but it doesn't make the situation any less awkward. The actual final set piece is Governor Redding becoming President Redding, which gives this person who is the main villain because movie, enough power to turn the state from a pseudo dictatorship to an actual dictatorship with such haste it would make North Korea blush. The modern knights of the round table are swept up in the chaos and driven away to a fate unknown, but not before they are not and are actually saved by man who you thought was captured. But before we end this, just remember it's a thinning film, so there is sequel bait. We're going to war. I wouldn't hold my breath. Honestly, at the end of the day, while I consider this far from a classic, there's nothing to get angry about. The camera is aimed at people and they are saying the correct words. I expect nothing more. Listen, I saw Morbius in theaters. My understanding of the word film is completely different than what it was. While this project is not my favorite, the director Michael Gallagher has moved on to a few episodes from the show PBC, which as relatively unpopular as it is, is a significant step up. There's plenty of shade to throw at it, but at the end of the day, it is solid work and much more enjoyable to watch. In fact, I would actually partially recommend it. And that's all the time I have. Thank you for patiently waiting for this video. Uh, don't worry, there is more to come. Uh, thanks to people like you keeping me afloat. Thanks to all the fellas for supporting me by becoming a member and thank you for watching. I will see you next time. Goodbye, adios, farewell, fuck off.